Good morning, everyone. Welcome to North Raleigh Christian Church. We are so happy that you're here with us this morning. If you'll go ahead and stand, we're going to worship the Lord together. His word tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and enter into his courts with praise. So I want to encourage you this morning to go ahead and let's begin to thank the Lord for who he is. Let's begin to thank him for the things that he's done for us and the things that we are believing that he will do. Amen. All right, God, we thank you. We worship you this morning. We thank you for your love and for your compassion for us. We praise you, Jesus. Come and meet us here this morning. Come and have your way, God. Let's put our hands together. dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. to us this morning, Lord. Well, we are so happy that you're here. 
I'm going to do just a really quick announcement this morning. So if you are our first time guests, welcome. We are so glad to have you. If you would just look in the there's a connect card in the back of the seat in front of you, the green card. If you wouldn't mind filling those out so that we can learn how to connect with you throughout the week. And also, if you'll take that to the back, to the welcome table, we have a gift for you. Also, we ask that we all try five because we feel like that's the best way that you could get to know us and we could get to know you in five Sundays. And then if you feel like this is not the church for you, we want to help you find that place because we think it's very important that we all get plugged into the body of Christ somewhere in our area. So if you would try five, the next thing that we have going on today, directly after the service in the cafe over here, we have our Discover class. And that's where if you've been visiting a while and you haven't become a member, but you want to learn more about the church, meet the pastors, see what our beliefs are, our core values, you can go to the discover class and find out more there lunch is provided so please feel welcome to go there all right well we're going to continue to worship the lord together this morning how's everybody doing though everybody doing good everybody having a good week well i want to encourage you if you're struggling with anything our god is here this morning he sees you he hears you he knows you he has a plan for your life. He says it's to prosper us and not to harm us and to bring us a hope and a future. How many of you believe that this morning, that God has a purpose and a plan for you? Amen. Well, let's continue to worship him this morning. We thank you, God. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. Bye. 
are worthy of our praise. You are holy. There is none like you, Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever sing.
our hope and trust in you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We worship you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we ask that you would continue to speak to us, that you would continue to have your way in us through this service and through the rest of the week, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Gosh, I thought I turned it on, but it was on the whole time, and so I turned it off. Can we start over? Yeah. Hey, good morning. How are we doing? Good. Yeah, it's good to see you. Glad we're here. Hey, we're in Romans chapter 14 today, and so if you have your Bibles or your apps, feel free to open that up. If you're here today and you do not have a Bible, uh, no worries. Um, if you just go out those doors and turn left, uh, we have um, uh, Bibles as our free gift from us to you, so we would love for you to take one of those homes. So just go and grab that after service. Now, um, we're walking through the book of Romans. We started in February, and so I hope you've enjoyed this journey through this, this book of the Bible, which was a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the ancient city of Rome. And there were a lot of things going on in Rome in the first century. It was just a, a wild place. And this brand new church was a mix of, of former Jewish people who became Christians and then Gentiles who also became Christians. And as they were interacting, Acting and trying to figure out how to make this, this new church go, uh, they ran into some issues. You know, there were some behavior issues and sin issues. And as we're going to see tonight, there were some argument issues and things like that. Now, before we get started, I want to introduce you to something. Uh, if you look at the screen, I want you to meet Maggie. That's our, that's our puppy. Maggie, she's a, she's a good girl uh, when she wants to be. But uh, uh, Maggie, it's short for Magnolia Ann, you know, and she's, she hates big trucks. When there's a, like a UPS truck, she, she goes crazy. She doesn't like visitors at first. And then after a while, she still doesn't like visitors. Uh, she, she melts down over smoke detector chirps. You know, that beep, you know, and when that happens, it goes nuts. And every now and then we'll, we'll get spicy and we'll just pull up that clip on YouTube and play it. And, and it's bad. You know, we don't do that very often. She loves to play tug of war. I mean, she loves to play tug of war. She likes to, to fetch. She really, really loves to shed and really good. It's like, her, like it's her job is shedding. She loves my wife. She loves my oldest daughter. She just kind of likes the rest of us. But, you know, she's pretty much, she's a good girl. But for me, what I, I think makes her what is best is that she's a mutt. We think she's a mix between a border collie and a whippet, you know, so that's kind of, kind of strange. She's got like this long giraffe neck, you know, and it's a little weird, but, but and she can't keep a collar on because her neck is so weird and her head is so small, but, but she's, she's great because uh, the fact that she's a mutt means that she's kind of just a, a, a mix of all, the, of all the best parts. Look, there's nothing wrong with having a purebred dog if you must have one, you know, it's like if you're, if you're, if you're fancy, you know, you know, go play some squash, you know, or something like that. You know, nothing wrong with that except for, you know, hip problems, you know, uh, heart problems, puppy mills and the cost, you know, it's just like that. Mutts, on the other hand, the other hand, you go to the pound or the rescue center and you bring them home and they love you forever and you feed them table scraps. Like, oh, we don't care, We're, we can take it because our stomach's not sensitive, you know, it's, it's really, really good. And, and you let them lay on the couch and you give them pets and, and, and they're just great because mutts have the best qualities of all the worlds that make them up. And, and they're more durable, they're evenly tempered, they're just all the good things. But they get a bad rap. Why? Because her name Mutt. It just doesn't sound fancy, you know? It's like, oh, I'm a German Shepherd, I have a Mutt. You know, I mean, it's just kind of the way it is. You know, but, but I, I think a lot of that is because the, the people who breed dogs, they want you to, to have, you know, you know, expensive dogs because they make more money, but it's whatever. But I'll always 
we'll say a mutt makes the best job. And when it comes to churches, I also say what's well, called a mutt makes the best job, makes church, because it's a whole bunch of mix of different kind of people, of different experiences, different age ranges, different church backgrounds even, and denominational things. And, 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 it's, and it's really good. And our church is, is, is that. We're a mix from all kinds of different environments and different upbringings, and, and, and we bring all kinds of different things to the table. And that's what's so positive about a church with this makeup is that there's so many different things that they come in from different sp- per- perspectives to the table uh, spiritually. And then when they're checked out with the Word of God, it just makes churches stronger because we take on the best qualities. Now, there can be a downside to this because, of course, there is because people are involved because it comes to... For those of us who have been church in a long time and we see something new for the first time that we've never experienced, we kind of want to, hold on, I've never heard that before. And it causes questions and, and maybe some frustrations. And then we have to go through the, the Word of God. And, and, I'm, and, and then maybe there's even, even compromise. I'm not talking about compromising the Word of God or who Jesus is or the Holy Spirit of the Father, but maybe on some practices or maybe on some things that do not affect if someone is saved or not. You know, things like music or the way we dress or even letting go of certain things that we had to unlearn because that's really not what Scripture actually says or, or when we view uh, church history or, or, or what our personal church history is and that's how we always done it but we don't do that here and maybe we have to back off of that and then on top of that we have to be thoughtful and we have to be very caring for those in the church who just may not be ready to accept certain things that they struggle with that they've never heard is is there's freedom in and so it becomes an issue if we're not careful and so this was actually a problem in the ancient church of Rome as well. There's, like I said, the mix of the Jews who became Christians, the mix of the Gentiles who became Christians, and these two groups could not be more far apart in what their backgrounds were and what they, what they believed as they, were, as they were raised and as they lived their entire, entire life. For the Jewish Christians, they struggled with letting go of the, the religious uh, practices that they had all their entire lives and that were ingrained into them, and they, they just you know, wanted to hold on to that because it was all they knew, and it was, it was a place of comfort comfort and then the gentile christians well they never even heard of those things before and they could have cared less about the sacred days or or what to eat and what not to eat uh, most of them were were slaves or at least were, were poor and so they worked seven days a week and like okay what's a sabbath we've never heard of that before is that something that we have to do and we have to keep and so so these gentile christians had no concept of this and so the result of this mix this mutt church situation was that Christians in the same congregation were judging each other about, by how they lived based on personal preference and standards. That doesn't happen today at all, does it? No. All right, those who giggled were those who have been in church for a while, right? Of course, because they're still people. Yeah, I'm still messing with stuff, sorry. It's uncomfortable now. So how do we get past ourselves, even though this isn't really an issue in our church, but we're preaching through Romans, so we have to preach it like this. How do we learn to live and be in a church with people who think differently, who are raised differently? And like I said, our church does this really, really well, and it's been very enjoyable. But Paul speaks into this in Romans 14. Now, before we get into Romans 14, I want to remind us of what was taught in Romans 12. It's been a few weeks. We've had Easter and spring break and anniversary service, and some of us have gone to sleep since, since we teach, taught this you know, three or four weeks ago. And so, so we, it's easy to forget. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, look at this, as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, that something has to stop, something has to die for something greater to pay some, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what, the will of, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." You see, we're called to be living sacrifices, meaning we give up and we sacrifice our wants, our desires, our preferences, our ways, so that we can follow Jesus and also help those around us who are also following Jesus and the people in our lives. And I think most of us who are Christ followers think, yo, I want to do that too. I want to give up all of me to to get closer to God. I want to give up all of me to bring other people closer to God. I want to do everything I can to, 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 to get there. And we think, yo, 
oh, that's a great idea. But the problem with living sacrifices is that they like to keep crawling off the altar. And I think for those of us who are believers who are trying to give ourselves to Jesus and trying to die to ourselves for Jesus, we keep crawling off the altar into things as well, right? Or is it just me? I think we're all in the same boat together and and we do that. We squirm our way back to our old selves and back to our old ways and back to our own habits. And in the church concept, back into the old things that they love to do that may not be something they have to do anymore. You know, we're, we're, we're taught we do not be like this world. The world is selfish. The world tries to get ahead and will use people to get ahead. The, the world teaches us, you know, use people for pleasure or for whatever that might be or any, anything that you want to do. That's what the world tells us to do. And we see that Christians, we actually conform to all kinds of things uh, that the world offers. Anything from sexual sin to gossip and on down the road. We still participate. But one of the main ways that we can be a living sacrifice is how we treat each other when we disagree. Now, remember, this Romans was a letter that was written to the church of Rome. It's an internal document to the church people, to, to Christians of the time. This is reference to Christians treating Christians in specific issues and areas. So in verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, As for the one who is weak in faith, Welcome him, but not to quarrel over, what's this word? Opinions. Not to quarrel over opinions. And this is a really, really fun verse. (laughs) Because we think back to Romans 12, our renewed mind will have an effect on how we treat others, especially those who aren't very far along in their journey with Jesus. The phrase in faith refers to a, weak in faith refers to a Christian who lacks moral courage to stand for their convictions or whose faith is, is, a, is caused to struggle when another Christian does something they think is wrong or they might not understand or, or, or may not be where they're at yet. It's just that their understanding it hasn't developed yet, even though they are, are saved and believers. But when it comes to our weaker brother and sister, we're to offer patience and understanding for that to, to develop and grow and to continue to love them. And see, with the church in Rome being made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers, there were some major differences of opinion that they were fighting and and trying to figure out, and and they didn't know what to do and trying to learn how to live. In verse 2, Paul gives us an example. It says, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Now, I'm trying not to make vegetarian jokes right now, (laughs) but it's in the Bible, right? No, I'm just kidding. I didn't actually do it, so it doesn't count. It's thought that there was a sect of Jews who were vegetarians, that their understanding of Jewish faith uh, were, were, you know, that they they needed to not eat any meat at all. And so they came into the church of Rome, and that's what they were saying. They were new believers, and they're saying, y'all can't eat meat at all. And it was causing them to struggle. And so Paul called them weak, not for being a vegetarian, called them weak because they didn't understand uh, the deeper things of faith yet. There was a first century historian, his name was, was Josephus, and he wrote about priests who were his acquaintances that he knew that only ate figs and nuts. They didn't eat anything else but that. There was a reference to Daniel, who in the Old Testament, to prove a point, only lived off vegetables and water instead of the king's meat and the king's wine. There were also Greeks who, uh, because of their uh, worship of false gods and false deities, they had vegetarian diets as well. And so vegetarians, this was not a, a anything that was uncommon in biblical times. But when they came into the church, they were like saying, you can't go to Texas Roadhouse and get a ribeye. And other Christians were like me saying like, bet. <laughs> but in this early church, this became an issue. And there became a fighting uh, a situation in the congregation. And I know that sounds so silly, but man, this, this happens today in churches as well. You see, Christians and churches are well known for fighting over stupid things that do not amount to a hill of beans. And I wanted to put that in writing because it's true. And so we don't do that. I mean, look, and I'm saying this, we, we have not had this issue in the year that we have been alive as, as, as a new church, uh, but, but it, I've, I've seen it paint color, how offering is collected, clothing, brand of, brand of coffee served before service was a big one. Uh, I saw people leave a church because coffee was, was served like over here and then they moved it over there and then that was just too much. Can't have that. You know, all kinds of things happen and, and we can't do this. 
Because we have to understand that when a church has a mixed background from different tribes of Christians, there's going to be different opinions, and that's okay. But sometimes it can be intense. And so what do we do with that? Verse 3, it goes on, it says, Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. So, look, you have different opinions on here. Don't hate each other over this. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. You see, the first part of verse 3 addresses the weaker in faith. Do not despise the one who's eating meat just because you don't understand it and you're not there. Don't hate them. And the second part addresses the weaker in faith. You have a role to play in this too. Stop judging because you don't understand. Stop judging because you just don't get it. You know, you have to understand in the church, there are those who chow down on steak and dream at night about Brazilian steakhouses. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we, we get that. And the weak were like, well, we can't understand that. We can't do that. But God has welcomed them too. And so in the church at Rome, both sides of this argument were absolutely at fault. The strong were to stop being mean to the weak, and the weak were to stop criticizing the strong. And so the best way to describe this is this. Christians must stop being jerks to each other over things that don't matter. Stop. Again, in our, I haven't seen this in our church, but just in case, don't do that. Don't do that. Verse 4, it goes on, it says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, this is a very harsh and a a strong rebuke. Essentially, it's who do we think we are to set ourselves up as God and judge another believer's heart in in matters of opinion? We just can't. Now, I do want to stop here for just a second. Because are there times when we are supposed to judge other believers? And the answer is absolutely yes, 100%. And there's really, there's, there's three ways. Uh, the, the first way, is, well, let's just start with John 7, 24. It says this, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So Jesus himself is saying, judge with right judgment, that we are to judge that. Jesus in Matthew 7, uh, verse 15, he, he says this. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a deceased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And look at verse 20. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." The first way that Christians are to judge other Christians is simply Christians are to judge other Christians by their fruit, are their actions, are their lifestyles, how we are living, the behaviors we're participating in, the things that we are doing. Uh, There are actions and ways that we're to live that are clearly defined in Scripture, and there are things that we're to avoid that are clearly defined in Scripture as well. Let's let's just go with it all in. Let's just make it super super awkward one, right? Want to go for it? All right, the example, the word fornication. Oh, gosh. That that word's defined, and it's all through Scripture, as as sex outside of marriage. Okay, if you are, 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 are married, great. Anything outside of that is, is, is defined as sin. So for two people to have sex and not be married is clearly defined all throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, as sin. And I know that's not popular in today's culture. I know it's not. I know that, man, probably someone in this room disagrees with me about this, but I would love to have a conversation about it. And this isn't trying to sound like I'm a big, tough guy. That conversation will last about three minutes because it's that easy. It is sin. If we know of two Christians who are having sex outside of marriage, we need to go to them in love and in grace and mercy and truth and say, look, let me help you become holy. 
Let me help you draw closer to God because what you're doing is pulling you away from God. We can even acknowledge, we know it's great and it's a lot of fun. We get that. But there's a better way that God has called us to live. And this isn't to shame. That's not what this is about. It's not about shame. It's not saying you're evil. It's not saying you're you're horrible. It's to say that God loves you and and God has given you a better way to live, a way that is fulfilling and a way that leads to holiness and a way that leads to, to pure but if we say that we can't be hypocrites about it right we can't be hypocrites about it but we also know that people aren't perfect and people make mistakes and people fail right but still that's the the first way another way that we're called to judge is there are opinions uh, that people will have in church who are christians that are simply unbiblical and they need to be corrected Maybe they were taught something wrong as they were growing up or, or something like that. Not everyone who says they are a follower of Jesus actually is, and then they, they teach something that's crazy or something that's whack. Scripture defines this as false teaching. In 2 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says this, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears. Look at this. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Like, they'll find someone to tell them what they want to hear. Verse 4, and, and we'll turn away from the listening to the truth and wander off into to myths, into false teaching. And look, we are seeing this today in our culture with the, the, the rise of popularity of progressivism and the secularization of our, of our culture. We're seeing this with the insanity of transgender craze. We have to call it for what it is, church. It is not okay and it is not right. And and we have to protect our children from this evil. How dare people go after our innocent children and teach them something that is demonic? And this is online. And if anyone hears that, I'd love to have a conversation with you about that too. Because we have to understand that there is right and that there is wrong and that there is truth. But Justin, that's mean. That's mean. That's not accepting. That's not, that's not love. What's not love is seeing someone run toward a cliff and know it's there, not say anything about it. That's not love. That's what isn't love. We have to pull people away from hell. Hell is real, church. Do you believe that? And so if we believe in Jesus and if we believe it's real, then this has to change us and it has to mean something for us. If we believe that the word of God is the word of God, then it has to do something to us and it has to change us. You see, when a Christ follower has accepted a false teaching that opposes scripture, we must confront in love in order to turn them back to Jesus. It's what we're called to do. There are also times, a third way that we're called to judge is that when someone in a church becomes, and again, we have not seen this here, when when someone becomes so divisive that they have to be put out. Titus was a church planner on the island of Crete, and Paul wrote a letter to him, and and it's The letter's really creative name. It's Titus. You know, he wrote a letter to Titus in in Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. He says this. He says, As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self condemned. And the only way to do that is look at someone's behavior and someone's actions. And say, look, that's not good, that's not right, that's not following Jesus, that's sinful, you have to stop. And so there has to be judgment of some sort. And I've had to be involved with these situations before, and they are awfully not fun. But God is so concerned about his church that we have to keep it clean and pure. And I'm not talking about sinners coming and trying to find Jesus, because we're all that, amen? That's all I'm talking about. Someone who is clearly uh, being divisive and, and trying to, to break things up that can't, that's just not right. And that's why we have elders and that's why we have, have servants. It's just a good thing. But then we talk about all this and we think, but Justin, you literally just read, do not, do not judge each other. Do not despise each other. Do not pass judgment. And we did read that. 
But to understand the differences of the differences, that's what's the key. And so there's really, there's three of them. The first one is this. Someone uh, has a difference in in a matter of salvation. What I mean by this is there's something going on in their life or something that they believe that affects whether or not they are going to heaven or hell, okay? A matter of salvation. Am I, does this, are they saved or are they not? In matters of salvation, you have to confront. We have to to step into that because our job is to bring people to, to heaven, amen? Our job is to rescue people from hell, amen? And so on matters of salvation, we have to speak into this. So is what they're doing or what they believe, does that affect someone being saved or not? All right, are they following Jesus or they're not? So that has to be there. The second one is matters of biblical submission. Maybe they believe or they're participating in something that clearly is not submissive to the word of God, and it's something that is disobedient to the word of God, and, and, and it's, it's strong. So we have to step into that and say, hey, there is a thus saith the Lord on this situation. Let's read this together. We've got to go in a different direction. And then the last one is a matter of opinion, matters of opinion. And those are the ones who are like, yeah, we'll see you in heaven and see who's right. Because there are things, and even in, I had a conversation this week, it's an interesting conversation, uh, about the different beliefs that do not affect someone's salvation. And it's, it's okay. So is it okay if they believe one way, we believe another? Yeah, we'll find out who's right in the end. So like, wow, for eternity, I was better. No, no, you're not good. It's not how it works. <laughs> but anything that does not affect someone's salvation is pretty much a matter of opinion. Anything that is outside of biblical submission, if there's not a thus saith the Lord, that's a matter of, of opinion. In verses 5 through 8, Paul gives us another situation that was in the church of Rome. And back in Romans 14, he says this, One person esteems one day better than the other, than another, while another esteems all days alike. See the Jews and the Gentile difference here. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The Jews were raised to honor the Sabbath, to remember the feast and the holy days like the Passover. The Greeks, on their hand, had no concept of anything like that. All days were the same for them. They worked sun up to sun down, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That was just what they did. And so they had no idea or no concept. The Jews had food that they couldn't eat. It was prescribed in the Old Testament law. The Gentiles, they ate it all. They ate, they ate, they ate everything. And what did Paul say? Well, you're both right. Neither of you are wrong. If you want to be a vegetarian because that is how you are, a part of how you are worshiping and drawing close to God, yay, go do that. If you want to come over here and eat a porterhouse, medium, rare, do that. You're both right. And that's something that our culture has really forgotten, that two things can be right at the same time and two things can be wrong at the same time. We don't always have to pick sides. And so if someone isn't comfortable with something, but it's not wrong, then it's not wrong. Oh, can I really just, I mean, we already talked about sex. Can I really make it even worse? Alcohol. Oh, man. When I started youth ministry in 2002, we moved from Louisville, Kentucky to a small town, Danville, Kentucky, a little town. Boyle County, Kentucky was a dry county in 2002, right? So... You had fast foods. You had three restaurants called Guadalajara, literally. Three restaurants called Guadalajara. And the one on the hill was the best. The middle one was eh. And the one that was over by the movie theater, you didn't want that one. All right? So you had three Guadalajaras. You had a Shoney's and a Reno's. That was it. That was all there was to eat. And so when we moved from Louisville, we're like, oh, man, there's, we have to go like 45 minutes to Lexington to to find food. You know, Amy and I, we call it, we'd have to go to civilization. And that's what we said. So, baby, you want some civilization? Please. You know, we would go, right? And so, but then there was like this vote. They were going to vote to make the, drown- the county wet, you know? And, and, and so our church decided that uh, they were going to lead the charge on keeping the county dry, right? 
And so it was newspaper, all that stuff. And they would ask me, I said, so are you going to, do you want the county to stay dry? I'm like, man, I want like an old Charlie's, you know? I mean, <laughs> but the weird part of this situation, because if you think of our culture, like here in North Carolina or in the city, or especially, you know, tobacco farms everywhere down there. Our church had ashtrays outside of the front door. The greeters would be like this, come on in here, you know? And, you know, it was, I'm serious, I'm not even making that up. It was, welcome to church, you know? It was just, just how it was. But don't you dare touch alcohol, right? Now, Scripture is very clear. Do not be given to drunkenness. Do not be mastered by anything with addiction. So becoming drunk and being addicted to wine, sin. But having a beer or a glass of wine is not. It's just not found in Scripture anywhere. Now, you do have to be careful with it. Amen? You have to be very careful. Is it worth it? That's, that, I mean, you have that debate all day long. You can have that debate all day long. But, and there's always a but in there. Verse 13 says this, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather, look, decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I didn't touch a drink of, of alcohol for 10 years in that county because of the culture. Because I was a student pastor and I didn't want teenagers to, to whatever. Decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. If we know that a brother, there's something that a brother or sister struggles with or does not accept, we do not do it in front of them. And at times, we don't even talk about it. Someone says, I struggle with alcohol, so don't drink in front of them. If someone struggles with alcohol and, and it causes them to stumble because, because, well, take a step back, you don't do it either. Why? I mean, because that's love. Because that's Compassion. If someone's faith is shaking by eating meat, man, it's salad time, you know? Can I at least have croutons, you know? Someone who is weaker, struggles with sex or lust, maybe ladies, you dress modestly. Guys, you don't take your shirt off at the lake, I mean, clearly, you know? I know that sounds old-fashioned, I know that's like, like, ooh, that's how church used to be. I, I know that's, I know that's like, it just sounds like it's lame. But have you ever tried talking to someone who's struggling with sexual addiction? Have you ever talked to someone with that? If you have, then you'd understand it. And you'd be willing to, to, to be modest men. You'd be willing to be modest ladies. You'd be willing to, to try to, you know, help them in any way that you possibly could. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's us being Jesus. I'm putting your needs way more, uh, way higher than my needs. I'm putting your needs and, and, and your struggles way higher than, than me wanting to be, be comfortable or me wanting to wear a certain thing or me wanting to eat or drink or whatever. Whatever your need, I need to help you get closer to Jesus. That's helping the weaker brother or sister. And that's what Paul is talking about all through here. Verse 19 says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Man, what was that? would that look like? Mutual upbuilding. So I think there's five things, five ways that we can approach this as we go forward with it. The first is this. When there's a conflict with another believer, simply ask this question. Is this a salvational issue? Okay. If you have a disagreement, or a disagreement even with a teaching, disagreement, is this a salvational issue? And, 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 it, and it's easy to find out. You know, is what, what do they believe about Jesus? What do they believe about God, the Holy Spirit? What do they believe about, about, about uh, you know, the, the purpose of Jesus? The, you know, what do we believe about the perfection of Jesus? Did he die? Did he rise? You know, things like that. This, what do we believe about things that affect someone's salvation? All right? The second one is confront sin the right way when necessary. That if there's sin in someone's life and we see it, we say, hey, can we go out and get some coffee? Or can we sit down and have a conversation? 
because you're doing things that God said is sin and God said is not okay. How can I help you? Here's where I struggle and I have struggled in my life or in my past. God helped me get through it. I'm not perfect either. Maybe together, let's, let's, let's help each other. The third is a statement that comes from the churches that I grew up in. In salvation, unity. In opinion, liberty. In all things, love. So the things that, that affect someone's salvation, we have to be in unity on those things. The things that are of opinion, uh, there's freedom. There's liberty in that. But in everything that we do with and we do, there has to be, has to be love. Uh, the fourth is, is this. Put the needs of others before our own. And when we become close with people in our church, not only do we know the things that they like and what makes them laugh and, and the things that they enjoy, we also know what they struggle with. And if we know someone is struggling with something, well, we're not going to put a stumbling block in their path. We're just not going to do it. And the fifth one is this. Learn to see others how God sees them. Even those who are far from God are Deeply loved by our Father. I think I just died. No, I'm back. All right. Even those who are far from God are deeply, deeply loved by the Father. They're desired. Jesus died for them just as much as he died for us. And so if we learn to see others how God sees them, then we learn to say, look, if you don't know Jesus, then, then, then my job, then my passion, then my desire, then my purpose is to help you come know him is to bring you to him. And I can start all kinds of different ways. You know, you can come to a group that you're with, a life group, go out to dinner, you can come to church, whatever it might be. Help people find Jesus. And when we start seeing others, how God sees them, that becomes one of our passions. It just has to. So as we walk through, forward in Romans 14, and we continue to do a great job of loving others, which we do, all right? This is not an angry sermon like, no, nah, you're doing bad stuff, kids. You know, that's not what this is. But let this be an encouragement and a reminder of how we are to continue to treat and love each other. We're going to make mistakes. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to drop the ball. We're all going to do something we shouldn't do. Well, let's give each other grace. The worship team is going to come back up, and we're going to have a time of, of response that maybe there's a, a time, maybe there's someone in this room that you've never said yes to following Jesus for the, for the first time, and, and today's the day to do that. We have two lamps on either side of the stage. There will be a part of our prayer team who will be around those lamps, and just go to one of those lamps, and uh, during this next few minutes when we have, have the worship music and everybody moving around, uh, just go up to one of those lamps and say, I, I would like to follow Jesus. What do I need to do? And, and they're going to walk you through what that looks like. So if you'd like to follow Jesus for the first time, simply go to, to one of the, those lamps. And, and coming to faith in Jesus, the, the, the next step would be baptism. And so if you have not been baptized into him, then we can do that as well. And so if you're here and, and I've, I, I, you believe in God, you, you, you've chosen to follow God, you're, you're ready to go, but you have never submitted to the command in Scripture of being baptized by your choice, then come to one of the lamps. And we'd love to get that going. We can fill up the baptistry. Uh, it's warm. We have clothes. We have towels. You get a free commemorative baptism t-shirt, right? We have clothes and towels. We have everything that you might need. Don't be afraid to be obedient to the commands in God's word. Maybe you're here and just life is a struggle. You know, you, you, or maybe you see things that people are doing that's causing you to struggle, whatever it might be. Go into the lamps. I'd love to pray with you and listen to your story. Or maybe you're struggling with some sin right now. You've been making some choices that you shouldn't be making, making some choices, and you know the Word of God says don't do that. But you've been doing it anyway because it's, well, it's fun. We get that. Go to, if you want to go to the one of the lamps and confess that, and I promise you everyone who is around that lamp has made some choices that they wish they didn't make. Right? So you're not alone. You're not going to be judged. It's not like that. It's we want to help everyone become holy as we follow Jesus. 
There's also two stations on either side of the stage, and we take the Lord's Supper. We take communion every week here. We believe that's the command in 2 Corinthians, and so we, we follow that. There's two cups in the trays. The bottom has bread, and the top has juice or wine. Make sure you grab both. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was um, hung on the cross for us. The juice represents his blood that was shed for us as payment for our sin because the Father is holy, because we're sinful. Sinful people and sinful things cannot exist in the presence of God. And so there had to be a payment for our sin so we could come to the Father, so we could come to God. And that's what Jesus, being fully God, did for us. So take and eat and remember. Maybe confess your sins. Just come through the middle aisles and go out the outside. And as you're coming forward, just quietly in your head, just confess your sins of the week to God and let this be a starting point for a brand new week. You can sit and pray. You can stand and sing. You can go to one of the lamps. This is simply your time to respond to whatever God is doing in you. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for your instruction in, in Romans. We thank you that you are very clear on things of behavior. And, and God, we, we want to just confess that a lot of times we don't like what you had to say and have to say. We like doing bad things. <laughs> Father, help us love you more than we like doing bad things. Father, I pray as a church, as we continue to, to grow and continue to march forward under your authority. May we continue to be a church that loves and cares, that treats each other right. God, on those occasions when we have uh, failed and when we will fail each other, please give grace and please help those who we may hurt give grace to us. God, we know that you are good. And we love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. Oh, I don't have a contest for that kind of love. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to and you never forsake us, God, and that you call us by name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a quick update on our finances here. Oh, it's hot. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Neil Ferrand. I'm one of the elders uh, here. And um, I have the privilege actually to share kind of how God has been working through all of us in, in our giving and financials. So um, before I start, I'm envisioning a year ago, um, I think, Justin, you used the analogy where we're, we're building the plane as we're in free fall is a, a kind of how I envision that. And I've, I'm trying to think through that and how that's even possible. But in that reality, there were a lot of unknowns as we went from transition from two years ago into this last year uh, with, with where we're going to be and what the church is going to look like. And through um, lots of prayer and this community, you know, we've come a long way. And as we've transitioned now through our first year, we had our celebration three weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah, so we had our first year celebration. So I thought I'd give a quick update on where we are. So if you go to the first slide or next slide. Beep. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I broke this into quarterly um, view. So we started kind of in second quarter. I did feel, if you remember last year when we were first starting, we had no money. So we did an emergency fund where we raised uh, almost $100,000 um, during that time. That is not included in this report. This is kind of what would be giving kind of um, to the general fund um, from that point forward and any benevolence uh, giving that has come. So in the green, you can see this is in thousands of dollars. Um, kind of where we were a year ago. Um, so I can't see that from here. Let's see, I can walk over. 68,000 up to 76,085 and then last quarter, so that would be Q1, that would be January, February, March of this year, we brought in $114,000. So just wanted to highlight that um, and see just where God has, has um, been really just kind of, I had to say, blessing us through, through this. With that though, as we start to transition to the next slide, the expenses side. So where are we with the expenses? So we really are kind of right on budget. We have had a couple of things come in, a couple of um, worship equipment things. We bought a new soundboard. We've had a couple of things that we needed to do, maintenance in the building, things like that. But overall, pretty much right on budget. Um, and you can kind of see that there. If anybody has any questions on any of this, please feel free to reach out to me and I can give you know, more details or explain any questions you may have. So definitely feel free to do that. If you go to the next slide. This is, for those that like to look at graphs, um, this is kind of on a monthly basis, income versus expense, and the, and the line with the little dots um, kind of tell you where we were. So you can see a big bump in January. Some people give you know, more in January, or that might be their whole gift, so there's, there is some bump there. And if you go to the next slide, this is kind of a breakdown. So we kind of look at our expenses. Again, as we are still, we're, we're transitioning to now our first year. We're not just a brand new church. You know, we're starting to get past that that phase, we really are prayerfully considering where is God asking us and leading us um, as we spend our money. And so this is kind of a breakdown of that. Missions is um, a smaller portion of that. And then outreach, we are looking at those areas right now. So some of you may have been involved in a meeting last week where we talked about kind of some of the ideas that God is starting to formulate and percolate as we look at ministering to single parents. And we have other things coming up as well as far as missions and things like that that we're prayerfully considering. In addition to, you know, where is God leading us with the church and where we are with, with the money um, and, and how to best use that for his glory. So we do pray for your wisdom and guidance as we kind of transition from that first year uncertainty as we start to have, you know, a little bit of history and understand where God might be leading us. A lot of your prayer and support is very much um, helpful as we go through that. And then the last slide. We do, and I mentioned this last time as well, we do have a benevolence fund. We've raised um, just about $2,000. We've budgeted, so part of the general funding that everybody gives, we budgeted certain amounts of benevolence, and we've helped some people in the church over about $3,000. We've um, been able to use so far to help others in need um, this year in the church. So we have that set aside. In addition to any money that you give in the benevolence fund, we did a little pool uh, earlier for... March Madness, I didn't do very well um, on that, but, um, you know, all that money goes into the Benevolence Fund and helps the, the, um, the uh, elder deacons. Um, they help determine where the needs are in the church. Anybody that has any needs or things like that, they help work with people in those situations, and that provides them some a little bit more money. I also have added, you'll notice there's some, um, you'll see a couple other things that might show up, like student events and things like that. That's for if, if you have any students and you have to help um, pay for camp or whatever, that money is designated on there as well. You'll see those show up on the drop down. Um, so again, just to kind of summarize, it's just been an amazing 
to, um, you know, just see how God has moved through this with so much uncertainty on our part, not really sure where God is leading us. You know, just, again, the support that you guys have provided, the prayer, and just the, the um, community that has really formed um, as we've gone through this year um, has been just an amazing thing. One last thing, as um, we're continuing to mature processes, as we're getting past that, you know, I'm env envisioning building the, the plane while we're flying. You know, I'm imagining parts falling down and somehow we're putting them together. We do have a, you know, a plane. There's still more to go to that. But one of the things that um, Brent and I have really been kind of considering and praying about, and I've talked to Erica in the back a little bit about this, is um, after service with the offering, we'd love to get an accounting team that comes up and can count besides just Brent and I doing that, again, for additional accountability and transparency in everything that we do. So if you are interested in helping me with that, um, please feel free to see me after church or anytime. I'd love to get that up and running. And then the last slide, I have one that completely unrelated to finances, but I am going to work with Erica to get this sent out. We did renew our license with Right Now Media. There are life groups that are using um, this as a curriculum. There are a lot of great books. Um, we have not read every book, and we don't necessarily endorse every single book on there, but there are a lot of good books. In fact, you'll see in this picture a lot of books from Romans and other areas. A lot of great material out there that we have available to us as a church that's provided. Um, I will be working with Erica, and we will get that sent out in email communication so you know how to sign up for that and access that if you're interested. And with that, I will pray, and we'll close. Thank you, Lord, again, for just your love and mercy. And I pray, most as we listen to today's sermon, Lord, I just pray as we um, are in this world, I pray that we won't be conformed, but we can help transform and just show the love that you have um, for all of us and that you made us and that we are each are unique and special and you love us. And I pray as we go from here, we can live that, Lord. I know it's hard um, as we deal with people we may not like or have different opinions, um, but it is what you've called us to do. And I pray that you'll stir and work in our hearts as individuals and as a church, Lord, as we continue to seek your direction and where you lead us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.